Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of the JSD Podcast, Bjork Retrospective. Bjork, we're talking about Bjork. Last time you heard everybody talk about her incredibly lauded, the incredibly critically acclaimed album, Vespertine, one of, I think, a, a fan favorite Bjork project of one of our favorite albums. Uh, I was not here, but I have returned this week for the follow-up because we are here to talk about Medulla, which is, I am very excited to be here. We're, of course, joined again by Jacob Sanchez. And this is definitely an interesting place to leap off of just because this is a three-year gap from the previous record, I believe, uh, in between these two things. Yeah, which was a little, which wasn't as long as the gap between homogenic and vespertine, to be fair. But no. what we do have here is what I like to think of as the beginning of Bjork's kind of not, not dark era, but it was just kind of like they we're, we're getting into the albums now that are less kind of canonically recognized as, as classic records and more records that are sort of esoteric that see Bjork moving into certain more singular and insular directions with her sound moving away from the kind of foundational aspect that made her what she is which is exploring the possibilities of pop music and how far you could push it medulla i think is the first album where she kind of shies away from that altogether i mean you could argue that she moved in that direction somewhat with vespertine but those that record still had some basic tenets of pop music that were infused within it even if they were a little bit more deeply rooted uh, than obvious but here you have essentially Bjork kind of shirking away from a lot of the idiosyncrasy and catchiness that made her a household name and moving in towards more avant-garde styles of music projects that are more defined by a singular interest in a particular aesthetic direction and here we have a record that famously uh, is made up almost entirely basically entirely with the exception of some piano overdubs of recordings of the human voice that are manipulated and stretched and, and showcasing essentially all of the or as many of the possibilities of what can be done with a human voice as possible you have uh, not just Bjork you know, using her famously incredible range to go to some incredible different places on this record. You also have uh, a, var- a range of guest vocalists, of choir vocalists. You have Mike Patton on this record. You have the legendary Inuit throat singer Tanya Tagak on this record. You have a number of uh, various different individuals with unique and exciting and stylized voices that are here to try and engage in this exploration of everything that's possible with the human voice and it's interesting that you know and not all that surprising really that this record is kind of considered the first record that Bjork made that kind of isn't really like canonically regarded it's more of a curio it's It's more of a bolded album on rate your music of hers to give everyone an idea of how people generally speaking look at this album which is positive i think especially in recent years but there's definitely a significant degree of separation with how people have received this and with how people have received the last four albums yeah and and Bjork kind of i think understood or must have understood that going into it right because compared to her previous records not only is the sound here more sort of singular like one of the things that we have talked about that's kind of defined Bjork as an artist has been variation has been like you know going all over the map within a particular record and giving you all of these different like examples and porches of the things that she can do with all of these different styles and sounds whereas here she's kind of still doing that in a certain sense but she's much more restricted with the with the palette she's using and she's trying to explore with a particular narrow palette the different possibilities that you can reach through to and you have a record that compared to the records that precede it is less really not as much based around songs and song structures the avant-garde soundscapes of this record do lend themselves to tracks that are more unconventional some tracks that are shorter some tracks that are more fragments of musical ideas than fully realized sort of cohesive songs in the sense that we're used to from Bjork so it's easy to see why this is a slightly more divisive record why for some people this record just isn't really for them and I will say from the off that this is definitely probably in the sort of middle to lower tier of my personal Bjork ranking 
And I'm kind of glad that that's the case because I'm here with two people who consider this to be a top tier Burek record, I believe. So we will have at least some sort of variance and perspective. And I'd be interested to hear from our viewers as well, where you fall with this particular record, because it is a divisive one. It is a strange record. It is a record that kind of demands a particular headspace. And it's a record that maybe doesn't have the kind of rich rewards of some of Burek's previous work, but it is a record that deserves to be talked about more regardless seems like it's only going to get more and more acclaimed with time as time passes and as it Bjork kind of continues to issue us with new and exciting visions of her artistic whims but I will save some of my reservations to this record because I am still very very positive on it broadly because I think it would be worth leaping into this with Jake and Jacob talking about why is this record so special to you and why do you connect with this record and and what does it mean to you in the context of Bjork's discography up to this point? Okay, if I may go on a bit of a slight tangent, I have a weird history with acapella music. The most embarrassing thing about me, I think I told Riley and Connor this, I was in an acapella group in college and that's when I realized fucking hated acapella music or at least <laughs> the perception of acapella Inconvenient music. time to realize that <laughs> yeah um okay so well because i don't know like I, groups like pentatonix and like anybody like you think of your like stereotypical pitch perfect ass theater kid like who like is in an acapella group who just sucks all the joy and life from a from any song and just like makes it as completely lifeless as possible needs to listen the fuck to Bjork's medulla because to me this is I mean because look we've been making music with our mouths since the dawn of time like mimicking instruments and whatnot and this to me pushes it (laughs) finally finally this is the record where Bjork answers the time honored question what that mouth do <laughs> Has it ever been so definitively answered? I think uh, not. I mean, this is the biblical text on the question, I think. Yes. <laughs> so many variant diff- like different styles of singing on this record, whether it be choir music or beatboxing or fucking throat singing, all of it just meshes together just absolutely perfectly. Especially just on the first track alone. You hear the throat singing, you hear the beatboxing i believe his name was what was his name Razel, who's a member of the roots who yes. according to Bjork, did all of his did all of these vocals in like one take like they, like she didn't have to like chop up or edit his vocals it just is done and just done absolutely perfectly and you hear just the roughness of each voice as well like everybody sings phenomenally and yet there's still such like a a roughness it's like nothing sounds perfect on this record and yet that's what makes it perfect in my opinion yeah i think in a lot of ways it sort of reveals and i like you talked about your relationship with acapella music because i think in a lot of way when you listen to a record like medulla you kind of get a bit of a revelation about how shallow a lot of popular music in the sort of acapella vein is when you think about pentatonic you think okay cool they have amazing and, and very powerful voices but what how much of range are they actually demonstrating? Like how much, what are they actually doing to sort of push the boundaries with what you can do with your voice? And what are they doing to actually keep, you know, when you're just hitting the same few notes over and over again and relying on like stacking harmonies till you're fucking blue in the face, then, you know, it, it's a limited palette. It, it, it's frustrating because as talented as the people in, in acts like Pentatonix are and a lot of other acapella groups, it feels almost as though they purposefully limit themselves or they treat what they do like a gimmick. Whereas here yeah. with Medulla, you have a record where Bjork and her collaborators are constantly seeking new ways to innovate the voice, to use the voice. You have um, one of the great, one of my favorite aspects of this record is the way that Bjork takes one of the kind of core influences and aspects of her sound up to this point, which is her love of electronic music and 90s IDM and techno. And on a song like Who Is It, you get that realized through the lens of the human voice through beatboxing she finds a way to utilize the human voice to represent a musical idea that she has represented with uh, synthetic technology in the past and that's a oh, really yeah. cool and innovative next step for an artist like Beric. it shows there's purpose to that and it's meaningful in the context of what we know and come to expect from her as an artist and so little details like that the way that she 
knows how to use the voice to emulate uh, other instruments or to emulate sounds or aesthetics that we would be particularly reliant on technology to create for us is super, super powerful. I also was listening to it this week. I couldn't help but think how influenced Bjork must have been by her time working with Matmos on her last record because they are famously uh, artists who rely heavily on sampling and exploring all of the possibilities of a particular set of sounds of, or of a particular set of sounds that are a non-instrumental piece of technology can create essentially and what Bjork does here is kind of not dissimilar to the sort of thing that Matt most do with technology that Matt most do with hardware that Matt most do with non-instrumental non-musical uh, ephemera essentially in, in their records and and so you do get a sense of, of an of Bjork as an artist kind of uh, pushing more and towards exploring the, the the broader possibilities of sound and music than simply focusing on how she can expand pop music. I think one of my favorite things about this album too is the degree to which the human voice plays a role in this album's construction can't be overstated. But at the same time, it also is neglects to sort of focus on another essential part of the album, which is how the human voice is produced and amplified and sort of stretched thin on this album just because it's like you sort of get the impression it's just like oh well it's like an acapella thing and it's like that's not an inaccurate description for a lot of like what it is broadly speaking but it finds so many great little details and how they are able to manipulate everything and how like specific and weird everything on here sounds like as much as I will go to bat for this album as being one of her best, one of her most impressive achievements, one of her most unique uh, albums when in lesser hands, this could have easily come across as very gimmicky and very like a lesser step in another artist's career, whereas I would argue this is an essential part of her development as an artist. And I think it would even sort of define what she would go on to do later, like, you know, providing her voice as a sample for Death Grips, for example. It's just sort of like, she just sort of knows how much power is in the ability to change music on like this really, really essential fundamental level. And so it leads to a lot of like an, an experience that feels even for Bjork, almost wholly alien. And not to mention the album itself is really dark and really aggro, especially compared to the last album. So I would be lying if I said I didn't understand why it's not considered the canonical classic that maybe I deserve that it, that I think it deserves to be. Just because in like, when you look at it, things from a broader scope, when you compare it to like Vespertine or whatever, it's like, I would argue that this is even more of an unfriendly and dark album than something like Homogenic is. And it's, that's sort of why that album is a little bit more easily able to gel with people. It so fits into the conventions of the genres that it draws from a lot easier. Whereas, again, the only sort of comparison you have here is a lot of avant-garde music and a lot of stuff that just does not see a whole lot of attention in the wider musical sphere. Mm. And you get like these really interesting moments sort of in between songs for me that like Riley mentioned that there are a lot of uh, parts on here that are a little bit shorter songs that maybe feel like shards or, uh, you know, not fully developed ideas. And while this is true, I would sort of argue that maybe on this album more so than most where you know they might use something like an interlude track the sort of conveyance of the push and pull of energy and intensity of this album these shorter tracks are essential to how you experience it because if you just kind of don't look at the track list it's really easy to take this as one sort of like not a necessarily cohesive piece because there's a lot of variety here but more so something that is continuously evolving and changing into something else and you need moments in between the sort of show stoppers in order to feel like you know these are already drastically different and drastically strange sounds so you need to have something to serve as a connective tissue and like moments like uh for example, like Old Breton, for example, is a perfect example of this because it comes right after a moment 
where the energy kind of dies down and it needs to build into the next song, which is who is it? So you just sort of need that kind of moment and it's just inherently built into each other, hyperlinked into the experience. So it's also less enjoyable from the sense that like, again, homogenic, that's an album where each song feels really complete and really unlike any other or like post for example is the exact same way and a lot of people can go and be like oh i like this bjork song for this particular sonic idea or this particular choice or this particular style whereas medulla you can't really do that you need to digest it fully as an album and again while it does showcase variety it is maybe the most essential album listen of her work so far um I think it's showcased brilliantly on the first couple of tracks. Uh, the, the opener, The Pleasure is All Mine. Um, this song is, it's a great encapsulation of the record as a whole. It starts with like these different vocals kind of slowly fading in. It's like showcasing the acapella and the breathing techniques that feel kind of disorienting. And they kind of eventually all meld together and they set the stage for like Bjork proper. And then it, it feels like the way that she kind of mixes these vocals is sort of a logical progression from Vespertine where a lot of it focused on compression and how intimate her vocals sounded. And this song has like a really awesome moment where it has this false ending. And then like the male vocal choir comes in and kind of reprises the sonic idea that you thought was ending. And it just, the final third of it is just mwah, beautiful. And then like it just sort of returns to how it began. And it kind of gives you the sense of Medulla being this primordial extension of Bjork's connection to nature and the world, which is sort of an idea that she began on. You could see elements of it on post, but it was a little bit more developed and homogenic. And I feel like it's really reprised here and kind of paves the way for stuff she would do later on in her career. So. While this does have a lot of elements that I think can turn people away, if you just kind of get into its specific mood, which I, I understand it's not exactly an album for everybody, I do think though this is less of a detour than some people might paint it as. It's like, oh, this is a really cool experiment she did, but I think it's more than just that. I think it's also something that's key to understanding where she would go from here and maybe doesn't get the credit that it's deserved because the albums after this aren't as beloved as the things that came before it. Mm. Like, I think there is like some sort of catchiness and fun to this record as well. Something like, oh, yeah. where is the line? I think mm -hmm. that's a, one of my absolute favorite tracks on this record. Yes. I fucking lose my shit every time I listen to this song. Awesome. Like, because it has that really, really fun hook, as well as, you know, just elements like I'm not the biggest fan of Mike Patton. So when I hear, like, but when I hear, I, I know it's very controversial on this podcast, <laughs> but I think he's the secret MVP of this song because he has that moment yeah. where he just sings through like this fucking amp or whatever that just distorts his voice even lower than what he's originally doing. And it just like makes the song just that much more metallic and fun, I think. One of the things that I adore about this record is that there's always new pieces to pick up on every yeah. time I listen. Every time there's like a new vocal presence that stands out or a new little harmony or a new melody or just something in the background that just completely rocks my shit. And where's the line? I must have listened to like five times in a row because just because I didn't get enough of it. And like I always kept like a uh, focusing on like different elements like oh there's mike right there and there's bjork and then there's the fucking choir and then there's just oh like the choir is also secretly one of the best parts about this record yes. as well because some something i had read about this record was how she wanted to make this as a tribute to when she was 18 years old and she was she was working on a farm somewhere and she didn't really have a lot of access to, you know, instruments and whatnot. So she would just write these songs based off of her vocals. Like she would just come up with these melodies herself. And there's something there to, you know, making a tribute to when she was very young, but also the kind of concept of the record, making a tribute to before we even had instruments or whatnot, like even on the song Oceania, o Oceania, which is just, you know, a song where she's literally from the perspective of the ocean, 
millions and millions of years ago watching different animals and humans just you know make their own civilizations and whatnot so there is something i think to just making it tribute to when she was young but also when the earth was very young yeah, when humanity was young you know what's funny is like it's almost a meme on this podcast when we talk about artists making a post 9 11 record and i wouldn't bring that up except for the fact that bjork herself has said this is her post 9 okay. 11 record uh she was living in new york or she was i think around the time that 9 11 oh. happened and um she essentially now it's, it's not to say that she wouldn't have made a record like this regardless but in the years leading up to this Bjork's focus I guess Bjork's interests were more on and I want to try and communicate this without cheapening it but finding I guess a common humanity I suppose and and I guess finding the language of music that I suppose transcends culture essentially and is try, trying to make a, a, a statement a musical work that is not defined by a particular culture or a particular style or like a western world or an eastern world or anything like that to try and remove that broader sort of sense of a homogenous culture from her music completely and that was a sort of huge artistic focus of Bjork in terms of conceptualizing this project and that I think is an important thing to understand and appreciate in terms of getting what she's doing here and, and indeed what a lot of the subject matter of the songs are about Oceani I think is a great one to zero in on because it was the song that she chose to sort of lead the record with in terms of promotion uh it was the one track that I think she played on uh, talk shows and, and on live TV appearances that she did. Um, she definitely, she purposefully made a point of, of not playing or attempting to tour this record very much just because of how difficult it would be to recreate in a live yeah. setting. Uh, but still, it very much, I think, represents Bjork kind of borrowing inward to a certain sense and kind of stripping down some of the uh, flashier, kitschier eccentricities of her music to focus in on a particular aesthetic idea and and my thing is although i love the record i do feel that that gives it a certain ceiling uh relative to her other records and there's no particular aspect or track or thing on this record that i really care for any less than anything else i think it's very consistently excellent but it does feel as though it to some extent for me it will be limited by comparison in terms of how how singular and i don't want to say like one single-minded or one trick pony or anything like that but it is very much uh insular and singularly focused in a way that makes it a record that you can't just kind of put on at any point in time like it's more yeah. of an exercise than a record sometimes it feels like to consume it is more to have uh engaged in an intellectual exercise than to listen you know to mute to music for pleasure which is Again, I, I, if anyone on this podcast is game enough, is, is going to be the kind of person to listen to music as an intellectual exercise, it's going to be me. So I'm 100% I'm down for that. But it is an aspect that I think um, makes it a, a record, at the very least, that you have to approach a bit differently uh, compared to some of Burek's other records. Yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think about, about that idea? Honestly, I'd argue that this is the quintessential music nerd Bjork album uh not just because actually if anyone hasn't seen this yet it's it was made earlier on in his channel so I know why not as many people have seen it but Mike the Snare actually has an amazing video on Medulla if you want to learn a little bit more about how that is constructed and a lot of the cultural significance of some parts of it uh so go check that out if you want like a really technical breakdown but even in then like if you are fascinated by or even just want to learn about the art of music production I don't think there's a better album to do that as like a crash course than Medulla because it is such a dynamic record and it is something that like everything coheres together but there's never a moment where you can't isolate like every single part of it in your head and just kind of break it down as you listen to it and once you realize like oh in this song her uh, like the voice is really really present in the mix it's really compressed so that it sounds like she's like talking into my ear whereas everything else is kind of built around it and you begin to learn what these very minute choices that kind of fall into the background of other like music and albums in general, like things that, you know, you don't necessarily always notice. Whereas here it's kind of front and center. And the more you listen to it and unfurl it, the more you can kind of understand 
what the mindset is of the people who are making these decisions behind the board. And it also helps that all of these are backed up, I think, emotionally by what Bjork is talking about or what she's performing like or just the mood or, or tone. And that's why I think it remains so impressive to me is that it never loses sight of like the experience itself being very emotional in the same way that Bjerk's previous records have. It just does it in a kind of different way. Uh, I think that, I mean, Jacob brought up uh, Where Is The Line, which I think is a standout moment on the album. It's one of my favorite tracks on here too, very unsurprisingly. Um, mainly just because it's the first moment I feel like it, where it really exposes you to just how that shit this album can get. Yeah. Like it's such a weird fucking song. Like you have the sort of interstitial moment of show me forgiveness, which is like, I think a brilliant moment of sequencing because it's like a really stark contrast to the opener, which is super maximalist. This is immediately like really claustrophobic and really intimate, really compressed. And it's like the soul presence. And, you know, she's pleading for forgiveness and it feels sort of like in sync with the construction of it. And then whereas the line continues and starts off with the stark presentation of the previous song and then unfolds with like the processed beatboxing, courtesy of one of the many human beatboxers uh, that Bjerk enlisted. And immediately the tense and almost angelic choir comes to contrast as Bjerk straddles the line uh -huh, between rhythm and melody that's being presented by this gonzo instrumental. It's, it's a song that's about boundaries and it kind of displays Bjerk being on the offensive side of things, kind of like she was in homogenic. Mm. But it feels apt that this is like such an aggressive and kind of forceful song and it feels weird. It's got all these alien sounding details and process vocal harmonies and it becomes downright satanic sounding in the middle and then you know lyrically Bjerk is just asking you know where is the line where's the line with you it doesn't feel courteous it rings as more frustrated saying that she herself is elastic and flexible and is kind of troubled by this person's lack of willingness to do the same thing and it's nice to get a sort of bit of a reprieve from the chaos at the end of this song which is why i think it's sequenced and paced so brilliantly is that once the the they may not build into each other seamlessly but the energy that they give up totally does after that there's uh vocuro which feels sort of like handing off the baton to another runner in a race and like she's singing here it's backed by like a really powerful simultaneously subtle choir singing harmonies that feel really soothing and then you you can get Olberton, which kind of i already mentioned builds into who is it and i really like the sort of this is feels really like the kind of darker side the sort of subversion of the joy and fragility on vespertine which was showcased beautifully on that album but here this is like the, the opening lyrics of Who Is It are his embrace is a fortress, which sounds like it would come right off of that album. But it's sort of like the darker instrumental tone and the lyrics, like, so, you know, alluding to like the skeleton of trust kind of show cracks in the facade here. And you almost get the impression that like it might not even be because of this other person that she's singing about, but because of like a world like how it, Bjork on this album feels like a deity. She's like a primordial goddess who turmoil from the earth is being manifested into and I think you can get a lot of mileage out of that thematic material and this song is like her crumbling her doubt uh in her partner it's it's just it's a breakdown it's a it's a rhythmic percussive simmer and I, I think it's one of the best songs on here too mm -hmm. I, I there are like a lot of moments that do serve as connective tissue but those standout moments while harder to appreciate on their own are easily some of the best things that Bjerk has ever done. Yeah, no, they're, they're amazing songs. One thing as well that we haven't mentioned that I feel like is worth at least pointing out or acknowledging is that for the first time uh, in her career since her you know she kind of came through with debut you have a large proportion of songs on this record that Bjerk is singing in Icelandic uh, as opposed yes. to English. And it's an interesting yeah. creative decision. Now we will experience that differently to people that who are, for instance, native Icelandic speakers. And I would be interested to hear what their perspective is on the effect of that. But it does give, like, she's able, I think, to ex exercise a different part of her range when she sings in Icelandic because there are these, like, particular, like, trilled consonant sounds and just this particular 
particularly unique forms of assonance that Björk is able to apply in the way that she sings when she's singing in Icelandic, just particular tonalities, particular sounds, particular phonemes that she's able to use and tap into that she can't quite, you know, that you don't quite get as much when she's singing in English. And so it gives, it assists in giving her singing this additional layer of tactility when you hear her sing in yes. that tone. Like yeah. you can almost feel like the, the spittle kind of in your ear and not in a yuck way but like you can feel how um i guess yeah how brittle how skeletal how uh full of textural texture how I would describe her it. voice is and it's an interesting side of her voice that we don't get as much now i'm sure there is probably additional more meaningful reasons for why she chose to sing in Icelandic on certain songs in this record but it does show like to me like when you consider it in the context of a record up to this point where she sung basically exclusively in english except for like i think parts of yoga she sung in icelandic maybe a couple of other songs um you have this decision which to me feels like most of all an extension of this continuing like exploration of the human voice right not limiting herself to one language but exploring her native language you know showcasing not just variations in how her voice can sound, but also variations in how she can express herself through language. So it's really, really cool and interesting creative decision that's worth acknowledging. The cool thing about this album is that my favorite moments are equal parts, the more kind of bright and, and colorful and explosive moments, like Who Is It and Triumph of a Heart. But I also have a real fondness for some of the more minimal and sort of intimate Thank moments you. on this record like Vocuro which is a song that really leapt out to yeah. me this week while listening it's particularly beautiful and my favorite song on this record which is Desired Constellation that's my um, favorite too hell yes and what's Great really fun. interesting about this and I didn't know this until this week doing some research when you listen to it you hear this kind of processed uh electronic sound that feels very vespertine-esque yeah. in a lot of ways and you think okay I, you don't necessarily understand what the sound is or where it comes from and but it doesn't really sound like a human voice but this is a really oh. cool piece of backstory here that I'm sure you're, you're probably all familiar with but in case some of our viewers aren't what actually happened here is that the song was composed by Olivier O'Leary uh, and what happened was um he sent Björk this instrumental that she found so affecting and so moving and she just adored the melody of it. But of course she was trying to reconcile it with the fact that she wanted to do a vocal only record. And, and this kind of didn't really seem to fit in with that. And then, but she decided to include it anyway, before she actually learned that the kind of processed electronic melodic sound that you hear on the song is actually made up from a vocal sample of Björk from Vespertine, specifically from Hidden Place. Oh. But it's so like bit crushed and twisted and like processed that it's completely unrecognizable as the human voice. And yet yeah. that's what it is. So it's actually, ironically, despite Björk wanting to put it on this record regardless of its contiguity with the rest of its sound it ends up actually fitting in perfectly with the concept and you actually have here Björk singing over a crushed up sample of her own voice which is just another meta layer that makes the song unique and provides another exploration or extending of the concept of this album here Björk is supporting herself vocally in a way that's not the same as simply harmonizing with herself or doing overdubs but actually providing this unrecognizable counterpoint that represents a kind of like you could view it as sort of like a uh a, like a, a Björk's sort of disembodied like form or something like it, it's it's really the effect is bizarre and it's a beautiful beautiful song i absolutely adore it mm -hmm. i love her vocal inflections i love the way that she just draws out her lyrics and lines here it's very simple it's very there's not a lot of complexity necessarily in the singing but it's just so evocative and powerful and it sits kind of right at the center of this record alongside one of the other underrated tracks submarine which i know jacob you're a big fan of that song too uh at this sort of yeah. central point of the record where you get into a section of music that I think starts to showcase some of the more esoteric sides of Björk's concept here. Another song that's uh, widely, I think, overlooked or even frowned upon, one of the songs that I consider one of the great uh, Björk pleb filters, which is Ancestors, which is another song I think yes. is an absolute Ancestors. highlight on this record. 
Uh, if you don't care yes. for the Inuit throat singing of Tanya Tagak on this song, I simply don't know what to tell you. I get it. It's unusual. We, our Western ears aren't used to it. But my God, does Tagak really like go all over the map on this song. And it sounds incredible. I love the way that she is kind of backed up or not backed up but kind of counterpointed by Bjork's own piano playing which just gives it this really sort of unsettling and kind of emotionally intangible feel and when you think about this song in the context of that broader concept that we were talking about of like kind of going back into prehistory into kind of the the earliest sort of stages of humanity and the first kind of the birth of music then it has this primal and sort of transportative effect when you listen to it I absolutely love it yeah, one of the best things about this album too, and I don't expect anybody to argue with me too uh, steadfastly on it. It's just like, we've been talking a lot about how detailed the production is and how interesting it all comes together. But it's also, this is also a moment that sort of showcases A, the fact that the actual like mixing and balancing of everything in this album is nothing short of a miracle. Like it, it is one of her most like large and I would say enrapturing sounds and the fact that they're able to give all of them enough clarity so that nothing feels muddy or weird or stitched together is miraculous and it really works on this song in particular because it's it kind of starts with this sensual strained breathing and that piano and these two elements just kind of intermingle throughout the song and it kind of struggles to form a solid melodic line until they kind of synthesize as like her vocals kind of overtake it as she gets way more intense and then in the center it just becomes this discordant panic attack that's gradually overwhelmed by the melody again as if these two elements are fighting each other and it feels like that's sort of a microcosm of the album where she's taking different elements of music specifically melody and rhythm and beating them together and seeing like unstoppable force immovable object and then the collision of these two things is medulla you're lame if you don't like the song big brain yes. moment here when you were describing that progression of the song i keep thinking to myself like it's like it represents like you know a, a man and a woman in in prehistoric and the prehistoric era kind of coming together and, and having a kind of sensual encounter and and maybe like or not even necessarily a sensual encounter but just kind of like the coming together of you know early people essentially it's like yeah there's this contrast these two different aspects of it this harshness this beauty that are kind of intermingling that are kind of fighting each other that are kind of at, at certain points sublimating into each other I have to feel like the composition of that is, is purposeful in some way, especially with an artist as, uh, you know, conceptual and driven and, and purposeful as Björk herself. It's it works something going Because on. the yeah. album itself is so primordial and mythic sounding. It's, it's obviously got a timeless sound, but it does sort of evoke something older and more powerful it really does feel like Bjork is playing the part of like a Greek goddess or something like she doesn't feel like a person on this album not just when she sounds alien which she frequently does but she's really playing into this aspect of her identity just because she hadn't really I feel like fully embraced her wilder side yet and that's kind of what this album begins in terms of where she would take her career where it's just like the other albums, as idiosyncratic as they can be, I can still see a lot of moments on them being able to be enjoyed by a decently wide audience. And at the same time, people knew her for being this weird art pop musician. So this is her just being like, I'm just not going to do anything with the accessible parts of my sound and purely pursue weirdness in the most ambitious and interesting way possible. And that's why this is such a re-listenable album to me. It's just, it, it just becomes something different that like, I just can't really get what I get out of Medulla elsewhere. Like maybe Matmos, like they can kind of sort of have that sort of intimacy and weirdness, but it's still not quite as maximal as it is here. Agreed. But also I, I wanted yes. to go back to Vokuro a little bit. And y'all were talking about, she presents humanity in its, greatest and ugliest manner on this yeah. record you have a song like bakuro this was around the time i think after vespertina come out or maybe even before it was officially released her daughter was born and this and bakuro is uh an icelandic lullaby 
So to me, like, yeah. I, I was, I had thought that this song was her basically singing this to her child. There is a bit of a maternal theme throughout this album, right from the opening track, right from Oceania, where she is just playing Mother Earth. I totally agree with the uh, Greek goddess comparison as well. But then uh, the last track, Triumph of the Heart, which I believe was the lead single off of this record, or one of the lead singles off of this That's record, awesome. it had the amazing amazing video directed by spike jones uh, yeah, uh, where she goes that. on a date <laughs> so fucking funny uh with the fucking cat and <laughs> um i won't say much about it like to anybody who hasn't then, seen it like, everybody go watch it because it's amazing uh, but that feels like the thesis statement of this record which is it's literally all about the joy of making this album like you know making the melodies through like each pair of lips mouths and tongue like of each musician the love of music just shows through each breath that everyone takes through each sound that everyone makes it's it's to me like for an album that is that has these extremely dark moments it's one of her most she ends the record on one of her most joyous songs and i just cannot help but fucking dance every time this song plays this is another one where i just Hanger. cannot I just have to fucking come back to it every time. It's it's a great oh, song. Man. Absolutely one of my top three on the record. And uh special shout out to whoever is doing the random kitten meowing sounds in this song because every time that meow, 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 <laughs> meow comes in, I like literally like I cannot help but have like the widest yeah. fucking shitty grin because it's just a f- <laughs> it's just like you know, same thing with like a jungle cat or like a panther on utopia and it just cracks me the fuck up every time yes well there we go that's 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 further down the line to discuss as well but yeah this isn't her big brained album this is her big medulla album <laughs> well on that note let's move into our favorite tracks and ratings for burex medulla jake why don't you go first all right, three favorite tracks. Going to go with Desired Constellation, one of my favorite Bjork songs. Uh, Where is the line? And ooh, I'm going to shout out a little bit of a deep cut and say Mouth's Cradle. I really like how yeah, great song. everything works. Yeah, it's great. Um, least favorite, it's difficult just because it's got to be one of the shorter songs, but I, I, I still understand that they're essential to the entire experience. And I wouldn't remove them at all, but they are less essential moments. Um, probably, uh, probably show me forgiveness. Uh, it's, it works better for the flow of the album than it does as a, as a singular song, I think maybe like the least. Uh, yeah, and I, I'd give this a nine out of 10. This is like a, this is a top three Bjork for me. Wow. Hell yes. My three favorite tracks are, uh, desired constellation triumph of a heart and i'm going to be extra saucy and put ancestors in there as well because i've always loved that song and it shouldn't it does not deserve to be the lowest rated song on that record on rate your music which it currently is um, and my least favorite track is yeah really there's nothing that jumps out as a least favorite i'll just say my least favorite of the uh, interludes which is old Bhutan, uh, and i'm going to give the record a seven out of ten uh my favorite tracks I'm going to say, where is the line? I'll say triumph of a heart. And then I, from, I'll pick a bit of a deep cut and say submarine, even though I didn't talk about it. Track, I adore the vocals on that song, especially when it starts. It's just, oh, I love that song. Least favorite, I guess I'll also say show me forgiveness. But honestly, uh, I think all of these songs are great. And this is a, this is a 9.5 out of 10. This is yes. also one of my absolute favorite Bjork albums very saucy all right well I'm also going to plug August rating in even though he couldn't be here with us because he does love this album and he has it rated at uh, eight he has it rated at an eight out of ten on rate your music so with his rating included as well we get an average of 8.4 for Bjork's Medulla let us know at home what you think of Medulla where it 
ends up for you in your ranking of Bjork records? Is this the point in her career when you dropped off a little bit? Or do you think this is an underrated gem? Which side of the fence do you fall on? I guess we're probably maybe all pretty positive. But even if you don't care for this record, we want to hear why in the comments below. We love hearing from you. We've had some fantastic interaction on our Bjork videos that we're really, really grateful for. Yes. Special shout out to Storage Heater, who's always there on every single Bjork video to drop like a four or five paragraph essay about all of the background information that we didn't know we needed to know about each Bjork record. I if genuinely you, if you do that. Never doubt yourself. We love it. Yes. Sincerely. Like I, I genuinely like l refreshing the Bjork videos, waiting for storage heaters comment is literally like when that comment comes through, it's one of my favorite parts of the week. So keep that up. Uh, but if you're also haven't left a comment yet, or if you're have thoughts, but don't know what you want, if you want to share them or not, do it anyway. Please let us know. We do want to hear from you. We love the interaction. Share this video around if you have any Bjork loving friends who you think would enjoy this and make sure you like and subscribe and stick around for future episodes in the Bjork retrospective. We have a new one coming out every second week. And um, yeah, if you really want to support the channel, you can hit the join button. And for just $1 a month, you can support us directly, get your name featured in the title of every video on this channel, plus get priority comment response. And if you want to recommend us some music to listen to, then your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. As always though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Invisalign, made to move. <laughs>